There is no doubt that the reputation of the Soviet Union as a closed and repressive police state is well founded. What often gets overlooked, however, is that throughout the country's history, that repressive nature fluctuated from the extremes of the Great Purge and the late Stalin period to the openness of the Glasnost period. Khrushchev's thaw must also be included as a period of more openness and freedom and included a two-week festival in 1957, bringing young people from around the world together in Moscow to celebrate peace and friendship. I'm your host David, and today we are looking at the 1957 World Festival of Youth and Students. This is The Cold War. For two weeks over July and August of 1957, students and young people from all over the world descended on the Soviet capital of Moscow for the 6th World Festival of Youth and Students. The festival represented an unprecedented opportunity not only for Westerners to visit the Soviet Union, but also for Soviet citizens to interact with regular people from outside world for the first time since the Second World War and the isolation of the Stalin years. Utilizing the language of peace, equality, and coexistence amid Khrushchev's internationalism, the festival was attended by over 34,000 people from 131 different countries. But was the World Youth Festival in Moscow simply an innocent act of cultural exchange and celebration, or did it also have greater objectives? How did it affect the dynamics of the cultural Cold War, and what were its effects on Soviet society and Western perceptions of the USSR? Let's take a look. Throughout the Cold War, the realm of culture was undoubtedly one of the most important battlegrounds for influence between the capitalist West and the communist East. Though in its later years the Cold War would perhaps be better characterized as an arms race, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s it's fair to say that each side spread their resources more evenly. But why was culture specifically so important? Well, perhaps the main reason was because the international community's rhetoric of peace, prosperity, and progress for all nations immediately after the Second World War meant that states could no longer simply expand their influence through territorial acquisition. Instead, the battle was now won for hearts, minds, and ideas about how societies should be run, and arguably the best way to prove the merits of each system was to showcase their fruits. Thus, as the Cold War of Ideas got underway, both the USSR and the US quickly dedicated vast resources to convincing actors on either side, and particularly in the non-aligned Third World, that their system of governance was the best model for societal development and modernity. Luckily for the Soviet Union, the internationalist and cultural dimensions of the Cold War suited its existing cultural policies quite well. On one hand, mass culture and ideological engagement, and of course propaganda, were key tenets of life under both Lenin and Stalin, so it would be fair to say that the Soviets knew how to promote their ideology. On the other hand, the USSR's need to gain international recognition as a legitimate state in the 1920s meant that there was an established history of ideologically oriented engagement with the outside world compared to the United States. For example, in 1925, the Soviet government established the All-Union Society of Cultural Relations with Foreign Countries for this specific purpose. Abbreviated as VOX in Russian, it provided Western intellectuals and tourists with guided tours around the USSR to convince them of the benefits of communism and showcase its successes. In some ways, Vox laid the foundation for the type of engagement and cultural promotion that the USSR practiced in the late 1940s and beyond. For example, the USSR set up and funded both the Federation of Democratic Youth, the FDY, in 1945, and the International Union of Students, the IUS, in 1946 to encourage cultural exchange broadly contingent with that of the pre-war period. These organizations were closely linked with the CPSU's youth wing, the Komsomol, Unlike Vox, however, the FDY and the IUS were informed by and designed for the internationalist culture that emerged from the end of the Second World War. Indeed, with words like democracy and international in their names, the Soviet Union was demonstrably attempting to pivot more towards the humanist concepts of the day like tolerance and friendship. 
Though these organizations were undoubtedly intended to encourage sympathy towards the Soviet Union and communism over the long term, the thinking was that limiting overt references to Marxism-Leninism would paint the USSR in a more positive light and undermine comparably overt American attempts to disseminate its own ideological influence globally. The Komsomol, the FDY, and the IUS quickly proved to play an important role in establishing the World Festival of Youth and Students as a recognizable brand under Stalin, at least in the socialist world. Festivals were held every two years prior to the eventual Sixth Festival in Moscow in 1957. The first was held in Prague in 1947, followed by Budapest in 1949, Berlin in 51, Bucharest in 53, and Warsaw in 55. Their principal inspiration for these youth festivals was the Olympics, so organizers placed heavy emphasis on celebrations of national representation and the universal values we have already mentioned. This notwithstanding, the decision to hold festivals was by no means coincidental. As we've already noted, Soviet authorities, especially during the Stalin era, considered mass engagement in cultural events as a way to bring the state and people closer together. It was also recognized as a way to disseminate normative cultural values. Similarly, it's no coincidence that all of the youth festivals preceding 1957 were held in Eastern Bloc countries. With the Communists coming to power across East and Central Europe, the festivals sought to consolidate Soviet hegemony by increasing ideological engagement among young people to secure the region's socialist future. The festivals also provided Western leftists and Communists with an opportunity to freely express their views at a time when the threat of persecution at home remained very real. Early youth festivals in the Eastern Bloc were thus relatively successful in sowing the seeds of an international youth communist movement, albeit their impact was mostly felt within the socialist world and among leftists on the fringes of Western societies. Let's keep in mind, after all, that this is the height of the Second Red Scare in the United States. Stalin's death in March 1953, however, would facilitate a dramatic rethink of the USSR's approach to foreign policy. Khrushchev's infamous secret speech in February 1956 set in motion the process of de-Stalinization, often referred to as the Thaw, during which the USSR began to open up beyond the Eastern Bloc. As described by historian Pia Koivinen, quote, the period between Stalin's death in March 1953 and 1956 marked a pivotal time for Soviet relations with the outside world and its cultural diplomacy. Following the ethos of Khrushchev's new policy of peaceful coexistence, the Komsomol expanded relations to non-communist youth organizations, started to pursue a more deliberate strategy towards the Global South, and allowed more face-to-face -face contact between foreigners and Soviet youth. Amid this atmosphere of change in the USSR, the head of the Komsomol, Alexander Shilepin, astutely recognized that holding the Sixth World Festival of Youth and Students in Moscow was more feasible than ever. With Stalin's ideological orthodoxy in decline, the USSR could host such an event with the principles of openness that the festival preached. More practically, Moscow and the Soviet economy had largely recovered from the horrors of the Great Patriotic War, unlike the previous host cities in the Eastern Bloc when they had acted as hosts. The USSR therefore wanted to show off its post-war development under communism and had unprecedented resources with which to do it. Shelyapin's proposal to host the festival in Moscow was thus accepted, and though the CPSU did issue some directives on its messaging, Shelyapin was given relative carte blanche to design the festival program as piece of fit. He got to work reforming the organizations behind the World Youth Festival to reflect Khrushchev's new internationalism, advocating greater emphasis on grassroots cultural exchanges between ordinary people rather than the top-down, prescribed nature of the festivals that had been held in the Eastern Bloc under Stalin. Notably though, Shelyapin was a communist hardliner and a key member of the so-called anti-party group within the CPSU, which deeply disagreed with Khrushchev's criticism of Stalin. The group disagreed with Khrushchev so much, in fact, that they attempted to overthrow him in a coup in June 1957, just weeks before the youth festival would begin. Shelyapin also shared a view held by many other Soviet politicians that Western cultural tastes were decadent, particularly fearing the subversive potential of jazz music. Relatedly, under Stalin, the USSR had made a conscious effort to develop kulturnost, or culturedness, which placed great emphasis on high cultural tastes. In that same vein, in 1957, Shelyapin called for the continued development of aesthetic tastes among Soviet youth. 
But Soviet youth were still not entirely immune from Western cultural exports, and a subculture of young people fascinated with Western culture and the individuality it encouraged had developed in the late 1940s and the years following Stalin's death. For a more detailed look at the Stilyagi, check out our previous episode. But how could Shilyepin ensure that the Youth Festival in Moscow would not encourage these developments even further? Such questions certainly lingered at the back of Shilyepin's mind, but it was the 1956 Hungarian uprising which perhaps softened his approach. Though we explored the uprising in detail in a set of previous videos, to briefly recap, for 12 days in October and November of 1956, Hungarians protested against the USSR's geopolitical domination of their country, ultimately culminating in the Soviet Union's decision to send in troops and forcibly use tanks to crush the uprising on November 4th. Such actions made a mockery of Khrushchev's so-called peaceful coexistence doctrine and attracted significant criticism both within and beyond the socialist world. The uprising in 1956 thus created a real need to add more substance to the policy to help show the world that the USSR had indeed turned a corner. Moscow's hosting the youth festival now seemed especially timely as it proved an ideal opportunity to do just that. In this context, then, Shalyepin's preparations for the festival were unprecedentedly grandiose. It was estimated that around 34,000 delegates and approximately 120,000 Soviet tourists and journalists would need to be catered for during the festival. Shalyepin deemed this to require the use of 14 theatres, 5 concert halls, 40 clubs, and 17 open-air theatres. A new stadium in Moscow, the Luzhniki Stadium, which had been built to host international sporting competitions and had a capacity of over 70,000 seats, was used to host the opening ceremony and various other events. Moreover, several new hotels were constructed, central streets, museums and tourist sites were renovated, and the government encouraged citizens to decorate their streets and buildings with flowers to create a colourful and jubilant atmosphere. As a result, the government provided over 250,000 bouquets of flowers in addition to 2.3 million other decorations. This included 61 different posters for the festival created by Soviet artists, with almost 1 million copies distributed and placed all over the city. In total, the festival preparations were estimated to have cost the Soviet government over 200 million rubles. By comparison, the Prague Festival had cost around 2.1 million, Budapest 3.8 million, Berlin 5.9 million, and Bucharest and Warsaw each costing 2.6 million. Taking into account the Ministry of Culture's budget for building renovations and construction, however, the total rose to an estimated 640 million rubles. In addition to these cosmetic investments, authorities sought to rid the city of undesirable persons, criminals and the politically unreliable. This resulted in over 20,000 deportations from Moscow Oblast, 70,000 apprehensions by police, and an 8.4% drop in crime compared to the same period in 1956. To encourage as many foreign visitors as possible, the USSR also allocated significant funds to help subsidize those traveling from abroad. Indeed, while representatives from socialist countries paid $4 per day to attend, those from capitalist countries paid just $2. More significantly, visitors from the Global South paid nothing at all. The funds for this were provided by the International Solidarity Fund, another organization aligned with the organizing bodies of the Youth Festival. Regardless of the price paid, attendees received three meals per day, accommodation for the duration of their stay, and free public transport. To sweeten the deal, entrance to Moscow's museums and tourist sites was made completely free. This considerable financial effort to encourage foreign visitors undoubtedly reflected not only the demands of the cultural Cold War, but also the USSR's desire to cast itself in a positive light after the 1956 Hungarian uprising. On July 28, 1957, Moscow's big day arrived. A motorized parade leading up to the opening ceremony at the newly built Luzhniki Stadium meandered through the streets of the Soviet capital to great fanfare as 3.5 million people lined the streets before the ceremony. Upon arrival, delegations from every country marched around the stadium in uniform, bearing national insignia and symbols in a fashion highly reminiscent of the opening ceremonies at the Olympic Games. In a clear nod to Khrushchev's new internationalism and anti-colonial rhetoric, several of these delegations were listed as countries despite being broadly unrecognized as such. Réunion and Martinique illustrate this point well. Both were considered countries at the festival, despite being under French control at the time. In the meantime, 40,000 snow-white doves 
the international symbol of peace, were released into the skies above Moscow. Notably free of communist imagery, the Luzhniki scoreboards spelled out the word mir, the Russian word for peace, as spectators and delegates mingled with bouquets of flowers in hand. Buildings across the city were adorned with the symbol of the festival, a five-petal daisy with a small globe in the middle designed by the Soviet artist Konstantin Kuzginov, as well as the festival slogan Mir i Druzhba for peace and friendship. For the next two weeks, the festivals at the Luzhniki spread across Moscow as the whole city became the stage. An estimated 670 concerts, 88 circus performances, 39 meetings of young professionals and enthusiasts, 10 mass events, cultural competitions in 21 different categories, and competitions in 23 different sports took place in the various venues that Shilyepin had put aside or had constructed for the festival. In total, well over 800 events took place across the city, with the song Moscow Nights taking on anthemic status throughout the festival. Needless to say, the atmosphere was one of complete euphoria, especially for ordinary Soviet citizens. In the years after, the writer Anatoly Makarov, for example, stated that he could not recall, quote, whether I ate something during those days and whether I slept, I was just so happy, all 14 days from morning till night. Another attendee, Oleg Kuznetsov, said, quote, I perfectly remember those feelings, brotherhood, acquaintance with the foreign students, youth from around the world. The reason for their excitement? Well, as the famous jazz player Alexei Kozlov outlined in 1997, it is useless today to explain to the new generation what the word foreigner meant in those days. The Soviet Union knew nothing of tourists or businessmen. Journalists didn't walk the street. That's why when we saw thousands of foreigners on the streets of Moscow and we could talk to them, we were overwhelmed by euphoria. As these testimonies allude, the Soviets' efforts to attract as many foreign delegations as possible were highly successful. 75% of all delegates came from European countries, with the biggest non-Soviet contingents hailing from Finland, France and Italy, each of which had sizable communist parties. But were the foreign attendees simply communists and communist sympathizers? Well, the CIA certainly seemed to think so. According to a document it published on June 6, 1957, quote, the major purpose of international communism and of the Soviet Union in organizing and directing the youth festivals has been from the outset to use such occasions as a worldwide propaganda vehicle for the achievement of both short and longer range objectives. Though this was certainly accurate from a Soviet perspective, scrutinizing the delegations in more detail suggests that the CIA's characterization was actually quite far off. In fact, it's estimated that only 40% of overall delegates belonged to communist youth leagues or parties. More starkly, only 15% of the 160 delegates from the United States were communists or even leftists, despite the fact that the US had officially advised its citizens not to attend. For many then, the youth festival simply provided an opportunity to visit the Soviet Union, a country that had been mostly closed to outsiders for the best part of four decades. To be able to do so at relatively low cost was seen by many as an opportunity not to be missed. Now, as we mentioned earlier, one of Shelyapin's key aims for the youth festival was to promote grassroots cultural exchange and interaction. It's therefore worth asking to what extent Soviet citizens could actually freely mingle with foreigners. And the answer is that they were generally quite free to mingle. After all, with 34,000 delegates, even the vaunted KGB couldn't keep constant surveillance on everybody. Soviet citizens were trained on how to deal with certain topics in the build-up to the festival and received education on anti-colonial movements in the Global South in particular. They were also given prescribed responses to any criticism of Soviet actions in Hungary or communism more broadly that they were likely to face. It's thus useful to think of the openness of the festival as part of the performance, and the Soviet authorities' intention to show that communism provided a viable societal alternative to capitalism. But still, even if the festival's openness was performative, it didn't necessarily matter. By most accounts, foreigners and locals alike were genuinely free to interact with whomever they wanted and discuss pretty much whatever they liked, while Komsomol records suggest that throughout the entire festival there was only one attempt to cancel a jazz performance by Western artists despite the nefarious regard in which Soviet authorities held the genre. Indeed, as historian Margaret Peacock notes, the festival quickly assumed an identity of its own. 
Neither locals nor foreigners particularly cared about ideology, and most simply wanted to have a good time and learn about one another. Included in this grassroots exchange of ideas and openness was what has been alluded to as a mini-Soviet sexual revolution, including claims of up to 500 festival babies being born in 1958. We should note that while official sources to that claim are elusive at best, there were over 100 Soviet girls and women detained during the festival for dishonorable behavior with foreigners. Not surprisingly for 1957, there are no records indicating that any Soviet men were detained for similar behavior with foreign women. Now, it would still be accurate to suggest, however, that the youth festival was something of a Potemkin village. For those unfamiliar with the term, a Potemkin village effectively refers to a facade. The term is attributed to Grigory Potemkin, one of Catherine the Great's ministers, who set up fake villages in Crimea to create the appearance of normality when Catherine the Great embarked on a trip of the region in 1787. At the 1957 festival, many foreigners inevitably ended up venturing to areas beyond where they were supposed to see, and several testimonies from Westerners who did so remarked on the extremely low standards of living on the outskirts of Moscow. Others noticed the prevalence of prostitution and anti-Semitism. Such sites were not just challenging for those visiting Moscow out of curiosity, but they also provoked serious questions among those from the outside world who were genuinely sympathetic towards communism. The 1957 World Festival of Youth and Students was thus a time of great celebration and euphoria, albeit one laden with contradiction for many of those who attended. So what, if any, were its lasting effects on the cultural Cold War? Well, it's fair to say that perceptions of the Soviet Union dramatically improved based on what the delegations had seen, especially as many were sent directly by their own governments. Criticism of the USSR regarding the 1956 Hungarian uprising and the violence of the Stalin period began to subside, and for a few years things between East and West certainly became more tolerant. But there was also a sense, on both sides, that they had learned from each other. As put by Margaret Peacock, quote, The Sixth World Festival was reflective of a larger evolution in domestic and foreign Cold War policy that was happening in the mid to late 1950s on both sides of the Iron Curtain. It meant more than the construction of a new state-sanctioned activist national image. It represented a tenuous but nonetheless viable opportunity to expand the conceptual, visual, and linguistic boundaries that defined Soviet and American society in the Cold War. In effect, the internationalist values of the USSR and the US had parroted but not necessarily believed actually became more important. Cultural exchange and diplomacy was now underpinned by acceptance and healthy competition rather than pure demonization, notwithstanding the fact that such negative propaganda did continue on both sides domestically. And what about Soviet society itself? The festival was the first time that many ordinary Soviet citizens had even seen, let alone conversed with, foreigners, and this undoubtedly left its mark. Well, it would be inaccurate to suggest that the festival irreversibly changed Soviet society, the cultural thaw that characterized Khrushchev's tenure clearly accelerated. In 1959, for example, Moscow hosted the American National Exhibition in Gorky Park, something which would have been incomprehensible just a few years earlier. The same year, Moscow won the bid to host the World Expo in 1967, the first socialist country to do so, but withdrew in 1962 due to the scale of the costs. Still though, these developments were broadly indicative of Soviet priorities and a desire to open up further. Moreover, notwithstanding the Komsomol's post-festival reports claim that, quote, in encounters with young people from the capitalist countries, Soviet people acknowledged the narrowness of their Western view, the poverty of their spirituality, the banality, and the decadence of their morals. Authorities did recognize that they needed to start appealing to things that Soviet youths actually wanted. Jazz was in particularly hot demand, and in late 1957, Shelyepin requested that the Council of Ministers increase the production of musical instruments, including saxophones, to raise youth involvement. Once again, a notable change given the negative attitudes beforehand. Relatedly, the festival helped give rise to a strange new subculture, the Fartsovchiki. Having learned about Coca-Cola, flared skirts, sneakers, and jeans, many young Soviets took it upon themselves to start buying and selling these goods on the black market, picking up where the Stilyagi left off. While these more direct cultural impacts were admittedly confined mostly to Moscow and Leningrad, the broader implications of the festival were certainly felt across the USSR. 
Overall then, the 6th World Festival of Youth and Students in Moscow was a watershed moment that changed the dynamics of the Cultural Cold War for decades to come. Utilizing the new language of universalism and internationalism, it heavily leaned on the international culture of the early Cold War, but also reshaped it and made it tangible in a way that US's cultural outreach did not. Moreover, not only did many foreigners get to visit the USSR for the first time, but Soviet citizens got a chance to interact with foreigners with unprecedented freedom. For better or worse, this was a freedom that most would not experience again until over two decades later, when Moscow controversially hosted the Olympics in 1980. We hope you've enjoyed this episode, and to make sure you don't miss our future work, please make sure you're subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button to make sure you don't miss all of those future episodes, even if you see that bell button chatting up that cute French delegate. Please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash thecoldwar or through YouTube membership. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com. This is the Cold War Channel, and as we think about the Cold War, please remember that history is shades of grey and rarely black and white. <laughs>